Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Robust American Love. My name is Karen Carboner, and I am president of the Walt Whitman Initiative. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization whose mission it is to celebrate New York City's literary legacy. We're an organizing center for cultural activism and poetry related events, just like the one that you're about to enjoy. Please follow us on Facebook and Instagram and tune into our live YouTube channel uh, to explore more of these presentations uh, on our Robust American Love speaker series. And if you like what we're doing, there are so many ways to help us out uh, with our programs, our initiatives, and um, most, uh, most on our minds right now is building a, a Whitman library which we are doing with the help of our uh, wonderful benefactor, uh, Susan Tain, and it looks like St. Francis College as well. So please visit our website to take a look at that and the support us link if you'd like to help us out. Uh, we are definitely fueled by our love of poetry, a lot of volunteers, uh, but we could really use to hear from you as well. So you're always welcome to contact us. We decided to offer this speaker series, and note the word speaker, this is not a lecture series, to present timely public-facing conversations on Whitman's life, work, and le legacy. And it's, it's really expanded from that, as you know from our talk today with Tanya Kohang, uh, that this is not directly related to Whitman, but politically related to what Whitman stood for. Um, and we felt that Tanya really um, brought it to the present day. So we're so, so excited to have her here. So we have poets like Tanya, but we have other uh, speakers as well. As you know, if you've been listening to the show, very excited to bring um, all sorts of different voices here that may not, um, you know, get the, the attention that they so deserve. So please do enjoy the series as we have it posted uh, at our YouTube channel or at our uh, website and keep on tuning in for more shows. Tonight, we have a program that we've called The War Still Within, Seeking Justice with poet Tanya Ko Hong. And I wanna welcome Tanya to the show. Tanya, could you turn on your video and sound? We'd love to see you. There she Hello. is. Yes, <laughs> welcome to the show. I'm so excited that you're here. Thank and you for the invitation. Mm. Wonderful, wonderful. And we got connected. I wanted to tell the audience by uh, Danielle, who we met at the Poets. Oh, gosh, I'm going to mess it up. It's not the Poetry Society, but it was the oh, I forgot. Were the you in the Governor's Island? Exactly. Yeah, I forgot the Poetry name. Poetry Festival. New York Poetry Festival. Yes. Thank you. The New That's York. That's how I met her too there. Yes. Yeah. An incredible festival that happened on Governor's Island this summer. And we met Danielle, who drives the, um, the bookmobile. And she connected us with Tanya. And I have to say that we were so moved by your poetry. We're, we're delighted to have you here. And I just want to offer a bit of an introduction here. So we know that you were the first Korean American recipient of the Yeondunju Korean American Literature Award. That sounds very impressive. Your segmented poem, Comfort Woman, which we will hear in a moment, won the 11th Moon Prize from Writing in a Woman's Voice and received an honorable mention from the Women's National Book Association. So this poem is one of several in your most recent collection, The War It's Still Within. And I think we see the cover of that book behind you on the poster. Yes. yes. Um, and, you know, just talking to you, very interested in, very interesting to find out that the book was published in the US, but also recently republished in Korea. And, you know, just receiving a different audience there, which I want to talk about with you. Um, the book is really uh, focused on the idea of the experiences of Korean comfort women, as they were called. Uh, these are women that were not prostitutes, but were forced into sexual slavery by the Japanese Imperial Army during World War II. It is a shocking 
story, especially if you have not heard about them before. And I think, Tanya, you are determined to expose this unwritten history. Um, so I'm really, you know, looking forward to talking to you about that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I know you were born and raised in South Korea, but you came to the U.S. at the age of 18 and that you're writing in both English and Korean. Um, and actually you are translating your own work, which is really exciting. Um, you, it looks like you write on a, 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 a variety of topics, parenting, culture, marriage, women's issues. Um, are you still writing for Korea daily as well? Not right now, not at this point, yes. Okay, but that was a long lived series, right? Since 1988. Yeah. Yes. Um, you've taught creative writing, you've taught the Korean language, bilingual writing workshops. Mm -hmm. I know you yourself have participated in many workshops. You were telling me about the around the block theater group that you were part of, that you actually staged your poem Comfort Woman, which is fan fantastic. And as we were saying, this doesn't happen every day that you see a poem on stage. So we will have to talk to you about that. And you've really organized a lot of multicultural events in Southern California. It sounds like you're living by coastally now though, right? New York. And yeah, so, so uh, yeah, like actually starting by coastally 2021. So I'm, um, you know, mostly right now I'm in New York, but I'm still, I just had another theater uh, performance at Los Angeles and Ruskin Theater. Actually, we did the Michael Caine project. So um, I flew there and then we did a theater project and then came back, so yeah. Very exciting. So lots of success. Uh, you've done so many wonderful things. And I think the heart of your work right now is this very striking poem, Comfort Woman. So I thought before we really start with anything, it would be very dramatic to hear you read it. And then after you read it, maybe I can post it for everyone to take a look at. We can talk about it a bit. Um, but if you don't mind just opening up with that poem, that would be really great. Thank you. Comfort Women. August 14, 1991, Seoul, South Korea. A woman named Hak Sun Kim came forward to denounce the Japanese for the sexual enslavement of more than 200,000 women during World War II. They were known as Wianbu in Korean and Comfort Women in English. 1991, Seoul, South Korea. The voice on TV is comforting, like having a person beside me talking all the time while I eat my burnt rice grill. Suddenly in Japanese, but we didn't. Those women came to us for the money. We never forced. I dropped my spoon into my nurumba. On the screen a photograph of young girls sit in an open truck like the one I rode with the Sunja over the rice field road years ago. 3 a.m. Waking in a cold sweat, I glop chariki, barka, barka. But my throat still burns. I reach for a cigarette and the white smoke spires like a Sunja's wandering soul. They call me Wianbu, a comfort woman, but I had a name. 1939, Jinju, South Gyeongsang Province. We are going to Sanambari, right? No, Jiangshinde, women's labor's coat. Same thing, right? Earn money, become new women, come back home soon. Holding tiny hands, fingertips, bongsunga, or some flower red, colored by summer's end. Riping persimmons bending over choga roofs fade into distance. When the truck crosses the last hill, leaving our hometown in the dust, 
Sunja kicks off her white shoes. 1941, that autumn. Autumn night, Japanese soldiers whittling swords drag me away while I eat gathering pine needles that fell from my basket, filling the air with the scent of the white blood. When you scream in your dream, there's no sound. On the maru, grandma's making songpyeon, asking mom, is the water boiling? Will she bring pine needles before my eyeballs fall out? I feel pain there. They put a long stick between my legs. Open up, open, bakka josenjin. They rage, spraying their sperm, the smell of a burning dog burning life, panting, grunting on top of me. Under my blood, I am dying. 1943, Shanghai, China. One night, a soldier asked the older girls, who can do 100 men? I raised my hand, Sun Zhang did not. The soldiers put her in boiling water, alive, and fed us. What is living? Is Sunja living in me? 1946, Jinju, Korea. One year after liberation, I came home. Short hair, not wearing humble, not speaking clearly. Mother hid me in the back room. And night, she took me to the well and washed me. Scars sealed with a hot steel, like a burned bark, like roots of old trees all over my body. Under the crest and glow, she smiled when she washed me. My baby, your skin is like white jade, dazzling. She beat her lower lip, washing my belly softly, but they had ripped open my womb with a baby inside. Mother made white rice and seaweed soup. Put my favorite white fish on top. But mother, I can't eat flesh. The night in the granary, she hanged herself, left a little bag in my room, my dowry with a rice bowl. Father threw it at me waved his hand towards the door. I left at dusk, 30 years, 40 years, forever, mute, 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 buried with me. They call me Uyambu. I had a name. 1991, 3 a.m. The night, the thousand blue stars became white butterflies through ripped rice paper and flew into my room. One, 100, 1,000 butterflies, endless white butterflies going through the web in my mouth into my unhealed red scars, stitching one by one. Butterflies lifting me, heavier than dead. Butterflies opening my bedroom door, heavier than shame. At dawn, I stand. Thank you. Oh my goodness, Tanya. I think that even if people do not know what you mean by comfort woman, the, the tragedy clearly comes through these words and your reading of it is, is eloquent and so powerful. Um, but maybe we can open it up just for people who may not understand the basics of what a comfort woman was. Could you give just a, a maybe a short introduction to what that phrase means? Yeah, um, actually, um, I didn't even know of comfort women. And um, 
actually I was when I was in my um, MFA creative writing and then I am uh, we're talking about <clears throat> the another poem the Hanan Saran like which is the 50th century of a Korean women and so I um, came from Korea, so I wanted to know more about Korean women's artists. And then I was researching. And then actually, um, I think you didn't have a chance to read that poem, but like there's another poem, it's like Yang Gongju, it's a GI's, um, the girlfriends and stuff. So actually, um, I was writing about that poem and I got to see this, horrible pictures on the Google. And I said, what is this? This is like horrifying. And um, it was called the Comfort Women. And then I said, why are they called the Comfort Women? I, obviously I couldn't sleep <laughs> after I looked up pictures and then finding out like a little bit more of research and then who they were. And, um, so this was something that you were not taught about in Korea. It You were doing your MFA here in the States? Yes, yes. I and, mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, it's like, you know, it's all on like my research. And then I didn't know the whole these things. And, um, and just like so that um, the basic um, information, Haksun King came denounced that she was come for women in 1991. So you get right. that? It's I'm like the revelation is 1945. So that is 46 years later. And that is amazing. so amazing. That, like, I know that's, that's the way that you begin the poem. I, I know that people can't see that, but mm -hmm. that 14th August, 1991 in Seoul, yeah. right? That's when Haksun came. Kim, yeah. Uh, came forward to denounce the Japanese for this. So before 1991, this was not really uh, no. a recognized story, right? No. Mm. So 46 years of the silence, right? And um, so when she came out and out of like, so it depends on like, we don't even know exactly how many women were forced to get in there. Like it depends on, could be 200,000 to 300,000 women. Wow. And um, so, so 1991, she was the first woman. So the, exactly that's what happened, that she was eating. So all these women, because I think that um, they're, um, why they're so silent? Because they don't have, <laughs> they know that nobody will support them. They will, they know that um, they're ashamed of what happened to them, even though it wasn't their fault. It's a double, um, a double edged sword there, right? That there is the, the ingrown shame that the women felt, but also that feeling that if they did speak up, nobody would really listen. No. And maybe that's why in the nineties, I could see that maybe things really were changing, right? You know, LGBT became a more open subject and maybe just the general openness of that decade kind of provoked Haksun Kim to, to step forward. And I'm guessing that she also had a lot of issues being believed at that time. Well, yes. And then also that, um, so that like the scene that I was wrote as a poem, the voice of a TV is comforting, like a mini is that they're living by themselves, like a little tiny room and they don't want, like they're isolating themselves so that they're turned on the TV all the time. And um, so then like, because this poem that I think um, I gave a lot of cultural um, 
poems in there that which is not need to be explained, but like, I wanted to go more depth of like how they connected like a burnt mm -hmm. rice grill. Why they eat the burnt rice grill? Like they're mm -hmm. feel they're not worth so that they're eating just simple of the burnt grill, like rice. And then suddenly um, she her like a Japanese. So there's a thing so what's going on, you know, no, they're come for women, they came, you know, in Japanese. And then so finally I watch her interview, Hapsun Kim's interview, and she said when she heard it and then she was, she couldn't take it anymore. Um, when she was young, she couldn't go to say that I was come from women because she was scared because Japanese told them, if you guys go talk to them, we're gonna come and kill you. Mm -hmm. um so then it was like a fear but like at when i think she was about 65 or 63 about that age when she came forward to that announce and then she said i'm getting old and then i wanted to get apologized before i get die and so that was going on there and um there's the you know they're showing the photograph of like a young girls on the back of the truck and um so that's how they a lot of times they kidnapped it and then second um poem that i say sanambari or like junction day women's labor code so they're uh, advertising that like you're working at the factory and then uh, we feed you and then sanambari is another part that it is you make a thousand stitches for like a red belt like a red poem um Oh, that's good. So then uh, 1939, it's like the, it's the, so they stitches like the vest for the soldiers, thousand stitches with red thread. And then that is a symbol that soldiers gonna be survived during war. So it's a sudden body. And women's labor code is like, they go work, you know, as a nurse or like whatever. So they thought they were working for the factory or like, you know, nurses. That's how they thought um, they're going. And then they said, no, you know, whatever, but they don't know how to read it. And then they sign it. And then it's I, um, it's the youngest, that's 11 years old. Wow. Um, yeah, I'm just showing the movie, uh, the movie, the, the, the poem on the, on the screen so people can see that it flows in sections. And the poem really opens up very quietly, eloquently, this story. I, I guess one of the things I found most moving, Tanya, was that you use I, the personal pronoun. And obviously when I'm talking to you, you know, you are very personally connected with this. This is not something that you experienced, but you're feeling it very deeply, I guess, because of your Korean heritage and just, you know, your your status as a woman. But can you explain to us why you chose to write it in the first person? Yeah, um, actually, so then I wanted to talk a little bit of, uh, so, it, um, so I told you that like that I was studying um, Korean artists from 15th century and it's not just like them who couldn't speak 46 years because it goes the thousand, thousand years that you got trained as a woman role that you don't speak out. And then even among artists going that direction as well. And it was continuously by generation to generation as a woman, we don't speak out. And um, the reason I try to have like, you know, not using I voice, but I try different forms. And then actually first draft to goes to 36 pages. Wow. And then um, I was writing in English, but in the wonder after like I start writing it, I couldn't write in English. I want their voice and then their voice came in Korean because mm. 
that is their language, that's native language, right? So then um, I thought that in a way that giving I voice could be more intimate and then give a direct message. And then I feel in my body and that's how I used monologue. Um, I, yeah, I, I see that. Did you write this in Korean first or was it? No, in- that's what I said. Like the, I wrote English first, but like when I was like, you know, days like writing and um, that their voice, they want me to write in Korean. So then like I was, writing in Korean, of course, edited, edited, edited. And then I um, I thought if I just give all the Korean voice, it'll be hard <laughs> to you to understand. Um, so that I, um, I um, re- revised and then I um, wrote in English yet I wanted to give like all these details. Oh, so what I'm saying is that like when comfort women and then we're thinking like, oh, they're like, you know, sexual slavery and, you know, they're poor, they're sad, you know, but what I am trying to do in this poem was they're human. They're Mm -hmm. girls that who were like enjoying little fingertips, bong sung eyes, like the bong sung eyes, like a flower. You put the fingernails and then we put it in the, our fingernail. And they're like innocence. They're, and then we're just like a sort of um, putting stereotype, like, oh, come for women, you know. But what I am trying to say was they had a mother, you know, who's waiting for them. And then they're wait, like they're missing this home, like a persimmon, ripening persimmon bending over their roofs. You know, that's what they're leaving behind. And then Sunja kicks off her white shoes. Like that means like it's a symboling of that she's going to get died, you know. Mm. because uh. a lot of times when women got even raped or um, something like that they're on their dying so then leave their shoes that's and what they're dying that's... so like so that i don't know like so that shinza cooks up her white shoes means like a symboling of that like you know she's gonna die and actually so many people got killed, even the liberation, they knew that they lost and then they just bring everybody and then kill them in the hall. And when yeah. they came back, yeah, when they came back, like now they're short hair and then like not speaking clearly. And the mother, she couldn't, she couldn't really knowing her daughter, what happened to her, that she couldn't leave her life. And so that is, I wanted to show in this poem, I hope you get it, that they're human. They're, they longing, they had a dream. They're, they are right to enjoy every single thing that human needs to be enjoyed. That's what I wanted to bring out. They're not, we're not just, cannot be shout that like, you know, come for women, you know, like righteous, you know, not that, but like, I wanted to go mm. more deeper. What is really going through in their heart. And I think you really do accomplish this, especially in this part that you're referencing now, the 1946 part here, where you show the parents of the girl. Yeah. Uh, and that to me is, you know, she's, she's the girl herself has gone through so much, but when she gets home, there is a very troubled and confusing reception for her, right? Her mother hiding her Mm -hmm. and then only at night trying to bathe her and obviously having trouble living with the grief of seeing her child this way and, and 
killing herself. And then the father also, which is just so cruel. And I really think your the spare use of language here conveys the drama of this, right? Um, you know, when the father kind of kicks you out and then the cycle of years, right? 30 years, 40 years, forever, I guess, uh, implying that, you know, father and daughter really never see each other again. Mm -hmm. uh, but just that repetition, mute, 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 um, really got to me there. Uh, there's a silence there that is almost deafening. Um, so that I, I found incredibly moving that there was no recourse. You couldn't go home again, right? Yeah. Home was not the same. There was no way that people would understand or be able to, to sort of like take in and, and comfort these comfort women. So that's, that's the real tragedy. But at the same time, Tanya, I think you mentioned it before too, the, the poem is actually quite beautiful. And I was really struck by this ending part with the, the endless white butterflies. Could you just explain that for a second? Because I wasn't sure exactly what you meant by that. The, um, so I think so like the 1991, it was like the same year that Hudson Kim came pronounced, you know, and I think she wanted to own, owning her life, owning her freedom. And then now the stand up saying that it wasn't my fault. And then it's not shameful things that happened to me. I own it. Here I am. And so um, the endless white butterflies going through the web in my mouth and also unhealed red scars. So like there's so much of unhealed scars inside, but like now going back to stitching one by one is going back to Sanambari. So that Sanambari thousand stitches, like protecting the Japanese soldiers or the vast that now, not like a stitching for Japanese soldiers, but actually this stitching one by one, you're, you're healing your own womb. And, um, and also the butterflies lifting me heavier than that. And also opening my bedroom door. So like I wanted to share, they're locking in their own room. They don't open their bedroom door. I mean, is they're just like, you know, isolated, but now they're opening the door. And then, um, you know, the, you know, as a, like a human adult, worst, the emotion that human is carrying is shame. Mm -hmm. It's deeper than anger. So I want <laughs> their like opening, lifting their shame. They're not shame anymore. Such a powerful close to this poem that is so full of raw tragedy to have just that simple at dawn, I stand, mm. which, which allows us, I guess, to, to step back from the experience and say, as horrific as the, you know, what this person has endured, she has chosen to live, right? And actually chosen then to speak out yes. and mm -hmm. You supplying the voice for that is is uh, is she still alive? I wondered if she had a reaction to your to the your poem because that would be interesting to to know if she knew about the poem. Um, actually, she passed away, and then uh, when she came to announce the um, there's about two hundred fifty eight comfort women came forward that I would, I am comfort women as well. But now, I believe maybe less than 50 Korean, um, the Kumpra women is surviving. Then as actually there's the home call house of sharing in Korea, um, the Kumpra women is living, but um, they're very weak. And I think even, I believe like about maybe less than 10 people living in there, wow. 10 people, and then they're over 90 years old. And so they're very weak and it is really 
are. But weak only in terms of the body, you know, in terms of the spirit and also just having people like you speak for them, the story is not going to disappear. So that's the powerful thing about this, to carry the story, story forward, you know, even when the speakers are no longer with us. And I, I want to step back from the poem, Tanya, and talk a little bit about you, because I think it takes a very brave soul to take on a project like this. You know, I see you hesitate because you also are moved when you are talking about this. You know, it is a very raw, uh, you know, you know, very troubling history that you're that you're talking about. Could you tell us a little bit about what got you into poetry in general? And then, you know, just maybe the the journey that you had as a poet so far? I mean, when did you decide to become a poet? Was there actually a time? Um, well, the, so the thing is that um, I always liked write and read. <laughs> it's like most writers do, right? And, um, but I came to the United States when I was 18 and it was a lot of culture shocks and all that kind of stuff. And then I didn't speak English. And, um, I was like, I think like a writing journal was really got me through. And then I thought like when I, if I was in Korea that I thought I wanted to go study Korean literature or something, but I thought, oh, now, you know, I left so I cannot study literature. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I, so in, I was in Los Angeles, right? And then there was a Korean newspapers <clears throat> that uh, we subscribed and there was, I saw the contest, the poet contest, and then I enter and then I win. So it was like a 22. And when I say about this, uh, people got kind of like fascinated, but in Korea, you actually have to have a Korean, the poet license. So wow. It, yeah. That's so that's amazing. Do you pay for the license or? No, you don't pay. I mean, you, we, we don't say license, like a license, license, but like actually when you like a Google Korean poets and then people who actually they consider as a poet's names coming out because uh, they don't just say you're a poet because you write poems. You are actually have to win the contest. Oh, or wow like you are recognized by one of the distinguished, you know, the poetry magazines or whatever. So that actually I become licensed poet at age 22. And in Korea, Korean American Writers Association in um, LA, they're start like, so they're like about, they're my father, parents, generation or a little younger. And then, so I started hanging out with them and writing. But I was going to school and then I start learning English and then I start, you know, familiar with like getting into the um, American culture. But so that's the thing, like the I, our first generation, they're keep writing in Korean. They go to work. They don't have a time to write or learn English to continue in their uh, writing. So then I got, um, sort of like now, you know, I, so that this book is like 1993, Generation 1.5, they published, and then I was translating my own work at the time. So I, I just knew that like, I wanted to be a writer that was all along, but I got married and have a kiss and then like, you know, I'm writing columns and then all that kind of stuff. But I felt like I, I don't have like this platform of how to publish in English hmm. because my uh, major was sociology and then I got married and I become stay home mom. And then I'm just writing Korean like uh, columns and all that kind of stuff. So then I said, uh, I really wanted to study and then find out. So that was the turning point that I went. Yeah. MFA and then I start like know how to publish and then all and then I have to like really work hard as writing as you know English is the first time to write 
English. So then now, like, just kind of changed. I, I was writing in Korean and translated into English. And mm -hmm. then uh, while I was an MFA, I was writing in English and then vice versa, translate <laughs> Korean. Wow. And then now, um, sometimes I felt like, it's, you know, it's just interesting that if I don't, if I write something, if I don't write in both the language, I feel like it's kind of incomplete. Wow, that's so that's that I was like a teaching during pandemic, like I was teaching um, high school students during Metro that we did a workshop and then they're selected for LA poets to teach. And then we mm -hmm. did this, this workshop and then I said, I write in both the language. So that, do you still believe in spring, you know? So then I wrote in both the language. I mean, sometimes why do I do that, you know? And it is very hard. And then it is why hard because I thought if I just write, let's say writing English first, like a lonely bird knocks on the kitchen window. Okay. Mm. But that, doesn't write in that word. So then to equivalent, should I change that word? <laughs> so I'm playing myself. <laughs> Can I ask, is it easier to write for you in either language? Does English come first or does Korean come first? No, when you're it, it depends on, depends on like what I feel. Like, so for example, like probably see, this is the thing I speak with you in English, right? And then maybe if I want- Thank God, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I would be lost. Unfortunately, then, Korean uh, my skills. Yeah. Whatever, whatever, like I wanted to have like the reflection on it that I probably will write in English because my mind is occupying like and talking, connecting with the English. But if I talk with my Korean friends in Korean and that feeling of both me that my Korean feeling. And so sometimes I think it's just like a beautiful word that I wrote in Korean. When I translate into English, not so. Mm. It doesn't connect, you know, the nuance and feeling is not connecting. So I feel like I have like a split mind, you know, or sometimes, and then sometimes I have to connect to myself. To know but we, myself. the world benefits from you being able to straddle these two worlds. And I know you've done it also as a poet of justice, you know, that goes in our title for this talk. And I think in general, and this is really the link with Whitman, but seeking justice through poetry uh, yeah. use, using poetry to kind of forward, uh, using art to forward a political message. I was wondering if we could show, because I know we're going to run out of time before we can get to more poems, but can we turn to another poem just to, to put, to start this conversation about you as a justice-seeking poet? And uh, I'm at your website here, so I'm going to share it with everybody uh, to take a look at that. And we are lucky because you have put some of the text of your poems up here mm -hmm. and a personal favorite, I already told you um, that I thought would be really fun to do is a blonde whispers Korean <laughs> right here. Can, can, do you mind if we do that? No, one? I don't. And then actually I just wanted to mention like, oh my God, the, uh, Whitman's like actually do you know that he had like a butterfly on his hand oh do my know? do I know that he had a butterfly <laughs> I Jesse is manning this show that otherwise this would show would not happen and Je you know any wit maniac knows that the butterfly is such a I, big symbol oh uh, wow. for Whitman. And, and I, I remember giving a talk about this, that the butterfly has many different interpretations through culture, right? But yes. many cultures see the butterfly as a form of the soul, 
I was thinking that maybe that was where you were going in Comfort Woman at the end with the butterfly release. Uh, there are many things that tie you to the Whitman legacy in addition to the justice seeking of the poetry. You know, the poetry itself, which is, uh, you know, the, the free verse kind of openness, but also the, 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 the ability to be very graphic and very gripping um, and to deliver a message in that way. I find that that is something that also brings you into sort of the Whitman vein. Um, and there's an intimacy to the writing too. Like I feel like I'm part of the poems mm -hmm. because you are using a lot of personal pronouns. Whitman did this all the time, right? Very groundbreaking use of uh, I and you. Yeah. And making, the, making the reader feel like part of it. So I think when you're writing for justice, that's very powerful because you're getting people involved in your mm. politics. Mm. So, oh, okay. So really just great. And um, this poem is about two people who are we, Right. Mm -hmm. But it could be also anybody who's listening to this, whether you're American or Korean, I think you can really relate to the politics of this. So, my dear, if you don't mind, would you would you read this? No, I don't mind. But like just before I read it one more time, I, I wanted to mention that, like, actually, the, you know, the um, work uh, Whitman published the newspaper member like in Long Island. And published several newspapers, that is right. You did and your then work. Work. And then I just wanted to mention that, like, my poem was uh, published in the newspaper, Long Island newspaper, 2018. Okay. So I, I, I should have, like, sent it. Like, but, uh, and then I visited, like, you know, his home and museum in Long Island. Uh, the, oh, my but, like, goodness. Shout yeah. out to the Whitman birthplace because I'm sure we yeah. have people who are watching the show who work there and they've been great supporters of the Whitman initiative. Ooh. Now, was it the Long Islander, that newspaper that published? Yes. Your poem? yes. And okay. then there was a, the, um, I think the Whitman's Corner, I think that was 2018. So um, that was Bogo Shippo. That was the Korean word. I gave the Korean word. So that was published in 2018. Let me tell you that that is not only, that is the paper that Whitman actually founded himself. Yes, yes, he did, yeah. When mm -hmm. he was very young and he moved back out to Long Island because there was a big uh, fire in New York City that kind of yes. forced, just like Corona, a lot of people left the city to find a better way. And Whitman was kind of back in his, hometown area he was born in Huntington and he founded that paper when he was quite young and did everything he wrote the articles he printed it he even distributed it on his horse yeah. couldn't couldn't keep it up so he wound up just leaving it but the paper continued and continues to this day so yeah. anyone who's listening, if you know the so Long I, Island. I got the, um, the information. So it's the, the Long Island um, Icelander Huntington Weekly newspaper, Works Corner, June 17 through 13, 2018. Bogo Shippa, I miss you. That's my poem is there. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. That's a total bond. You should have told me. Ooh, I know. <laughs> All right. Shout out to the to to the Long Islander um, because they do put still Whitman in their masthead, so they honor Aww. their legacy with that. Yes, uh, I think that corner that was the poet actually um, George Wallace. He was the one who's doing the um, the worst corner. Okay, you know? so George Wallace may well be watching this show. George. Is <laughs> A huge supporter. And, you know, every year we host a marathon reading of Whitman's long poem, Song of Myself, yes. right, ar right around his birthday. Um, the last two years we've been doing it online because of COVID. Mm. And George always participates. He's he's not just a great poet. He is a great reader of poetry. Oh, he so, is. Yeah. Uh, 
six degrees. Actually, of I I translate right. Georgie Wallace um couple poems in Korean as well. Oh my gosh, this is crazy. <laughs> Okay, so, so right, we're that's in the house. That's that's amazing. Um, George, are you? Can you believe this? I'm I'm gonna email him right after this. Oh, I mean, I know him. He's a real good friend. That's great. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's okay. dedicate this reading to him. A blonde whispers Korean in my ear. Ooh, okay. A blonde whispers Korean in my ear. We were drinking homemade wine at a child's birthday party. When a blonde mom told me, once I had a Korean boyfriend, his mother hated me, but how I loved her food, bulgogi, japchae, and you know, you can kiss after you eat that. What is that called? The smelly cabbage made with a salt baby shrimp and chubby garlic chili, she giggled. I'm a bad Korean word, she said. Whisper in my ear, I said. I won't say it. <laughs> Her face <laughs> bloomed red, red as bongsunga. My face was frozen trapped. On your whole use that word. Never wives. Not even to their husbands. Never moms not in front of her children. When referring to the, mm -hmm, a Korean doctor say, Songi, a Chinese word, even after Korean invented. That's not a bad word, I replied. It's just a part of the body. Who does she think she is to say that word when I would never pronounce it with my mouth? Wow, this is fascinating. And I think also Whitman would find this one really, really compelling. So can you tell us like what, what is at the heart of this poem? I'm confused a little bit. So yeah, it, you are. Yeah. I, what, it, what are you confused about? I guess I'm confused whether or not the speaker thinks of that word as truly a bad word, or if mm -hmm. the speaker is gesturing towards that the human body is always beautiful. I think this is actually more about the um, immigrant lives that uh, actually that was contribute to rattle. And then that was, um, so I wanna I like actually that have some, that I have an author's note here. As an immigrant of the Korean diaspora, I know what it feels like being invisible, voiceless and powerless. And writing poem has a long process, even allowing myself to write certain words. Felt like impossible transgression. At the time, I was sick at heart in pain and angry, but something magical was happening. I was able to expose my wound wounds through new symbols and images. And what I am trying to say is sometimes I felt like kind of angry that I, we're talking about something. And even though it's our culture, like a Korean culture, and I know, and it's deep in our bones. Sometimes people like saying, oh, this is a Korean culture, you mm -hmm. know? And then like even not having ownership, I think I'm just really uh, kind of like frustrated in a, in a word like mad to that like, and then we're known as just like, you know, Korean food or like, Oh, she didn't like it me, but like I like the Korean food. Right. It feels like really insensitive in a lot of a conversation. And mm -hmm. then like you're invisible, like you know, you're Asian, like, oh, you're Asian woman, you must be so quiet, have mm -hmm. a no opinion, you know. And um that word, even feminist writer in Korean feminist writer, that she couldn't use that Korean word. Of wow. that one. Yeah, and then used um, English word to translate it. So that is me thinking um, 
And then we got like this role that like women not supposed to say that kind of word. If you are using that word, you're not elegant. You know what I mean? Right. So that I am just even trying to figure it out. Like, and we are okay to use a Chinese, Chinese word. Like even the doctors using Chinese word in Korean doctors. Like if, because it seems like that if you use the, Chinese word in that is you not know, lower, but if we use in Korean word, that is not right way to use it. And so I am confused with that part. And then, so there's a lot of mixed feelings. And mm-hmm. then I'm trying to say several things at the time that, um, is that like why we cannot say the word? And then um, if it's a man, maybe it's okay to say it. But like if you say women and then, you know, you got to wash your mouth with the soap or something. And yeah. um, another part, like living in America, that I noticed the teaching, even Korean literature, Korean thing that, American are the teaching Korean literature and then, you know, Korean customs and all that kind of stuff. And it's going back again because the power of the language, because Mm -hmm. if you cannot communicate within English, you are nobody because you have no word, you have no sound. Wow, very, so this word that you have, and I have it here on the screen, when you wrote it down, and I guess the 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 interesting thing that goes on in the poem is that the blonde American woman can say it, yes. right? But even without when- any shame, yeah, like, but like, come on, hold on, like, you don't really say it, you know? If she really deeply know the culture, would she say it? No. Hmm. Because I found it interesting that you did not even want to say it right now. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> so th- there's no American equivalent to this word, right? Like, I'm just trying to think that's that's showing the power of the Korean language, that there is actually, there is a word that you really, you know, and you are a, an, an open-minded and, you know, progressive woman but you still cannot say that word because I think it is um yeah I, I just felt like a steal because I don't know maybe next year I could say I don't know even I was like recording the reading and then I said like I think we're reading that poem at the rattle as well and then I said I won't say it <laughs> I think like it just like what is it? It's like a, am I if I say it and then am I breaking through or like brave? But I think um, in a way I am. I learned not to say it, and I think I am not comfortable to say it at this moment. Maybe later. So then, why force myself if I don't feel comfortable? And I actually think that that drives home, and I'm so glad that sh- that we chose to read this poem. It drives home the point, or one of the points of the poem, right? That this woman, uh, with without feeling, indiscriminately can just say it, and therefore, you know, her kind of song and dance about understanding and appreciating the culture. You really mm-hmm. see how small that is, right? Because that this word has such weight that she herself obviously has no clue like what she is actually saying there. So I'm so glad that you, that that we did this one because it leaving that absent, even though we see it on page is a very powerful expression. Yeah, Um, I, I, yeah, I think it just be, um, especially the, this time of the year that, um, I think we should really, uh, just like a work with men, you know, every single human, we're equal. And I think we really need to be sensitive to each other. And 
I mean, we're living in America, yes, yeah, so we need to speak English. We need to do, you know, everything English, but we just have to consider that people who are English is not their native speaker, that we need to respect and then be a little patient to learn each other, you know? And we cannot assume. I mean, these are really wonderful lessons that you're driving home with the poetry. And I, I feel that power, Tanya, of just like using art to kind of change the world, you know, one step mm -hmm. at a time. So because we are almost, at, well, we are out of time, but I thought I would sneak in one more question. And that is, we usually have when on this show, uh, the listeners are aspiring poets. They are often listening because they have some attachment to what you are talking about. Do you have any last words to anyone who is um, an aspiring poet, someone who would like to be doing what you are doing? You know, um, I think that um, we just have to do it. That if, I mean, I think for me, writing poem and trying to figuring out what I am trying to say and then putting in word is most precious time with mm. me and the happy moment with me. So I think um, there's a lot of reason why they're not doing it, but um, just even five or 10 minutes a day, give a gift to yourself. And then also, I this is like very interesting because I just had um, talking with my friend last night about this, like, you know, conversation. And actually he said that if you, the you know, the writing, like even a lot of times we get this writing gifts done, right? And we're just like what I said that I just like most precious, you know, enjoying time. And if we just keep it ourselves, we're being very selfish, <laughs> right? So that you do it and then you go share your work mm -hmm. with others, mm -hmm. doesn't matter. And then if you're true to yourself, the audience will connect with your truth and then beauty and then give to you God. So, yeah, who these days who's encouraging to write a poetry, right? But um, I do wanted to say this is most precious time, and don't wait until like when I'm done this or that this, you know. Just do it every day, little by little. And then when you get invitation, you just say yes. I will share my poetry. <laughs> Like you did, and I'm so glad that you did. I, I'm going to walk away with so much from this conversation, Tanya. I like what you just said about giving a gift to yourself, mm -hmm. but then clearly, you know, when you have done that to also be able to share that with others. And I cannot be more grateful to you for sharing your poetry with us tonight. A uh, very special evening. Um, Thank you so much for coming on the Robust American Love uh, presentation show. And I wanna also thank Jesse Morandi, who's behind mm. the scenes here for actually making everything happen. It would not happen without him. So thanks a lot, J Jesse, for enabling the show to happen. And of course, to you, the audience, for tuning in and uh, enjoying Tanya's poetry. I think Jesse's put up some links for Tanya's website, as well as the theater group that we mentioned before that has actually staged uh, um, Comfort Woman on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Um, if I were there right now, I would be skedaddling down to, to enjoy it or at least go to the website to take that in. So uh, thank you again, Tanya. Um, I hope our paths cross in person um, in New York soon. And okay. good night, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank